At 1.20 p.m. on March 23, 2005, a massive explosion and fire erupted at the BP refinery in Texas City, Texas. The explosion killed 15 workers and injured 180 others, many of them seriously. The blast occurred at the isomerization or ISOM unit, which produces materials to boost the octane rating of gasoline. The explosion shattered windows in homes and businesses up to three quarters of a mile away from the 1,200 acre refinery. As thick black smoke billowed from the plant, authorities instructed some 43,000 Texas City residents to stay indoors. The accident cost BP billions of dollars in victims' compensation, property damage, and lost production. This investigation was the largest and most comprehensive investigation in the history of the Chemical Safety Board. CSB Supervisory Investigator Don Holmstrom led a two-year investigation to determine the root causes of the accident. We interviewed over 370 witnesses. We looked at thousands of documents, literally millions of pages of documents, and we examined the plant, inspected over 40 pieces of instrumentation and equipment. The investigation team examined a wide range of safety systems, practices, and standards, and looked at human factors such as fatigue and communication between operators. The board's report was released at a public meeting in Texas City on March 20, 2007. Then CSB Chairman Carolyn Merritt presided. Many of you here tonight had family members or co-workers who were victims of this explosion. To all of you, I express my deepest condolences and sincere wishes that society never allows another accident like this to occur. The tragedy at BP was the worst industrial accident in the United States in nearly 15 years. The CSB concluded that it was the result of organizational and safety deficiencies at all levels of the company. We found that BP management had, for many years, overlooked warning signs of a possible catastrophic accident. There's an old saying that um, if you think safety is expensive, try an accident. Accidents cost a lot of money, and they're not only in uh, damage to plant and in claims for injury, but also in the loss of the company's reputation. The reason why the Texas City accident has such an impact is because when people look at it, they can see that they are all in the same boat, that they, the problems which led to that accident uh, are likely to be present at uh, other sites around the world. My fear is that some of, the end, some of the other refineries within the United States will feel that couldn't happen to me. And the ones that feel that that couldn't happen at their site is the ones that are set up to have it happen there. The following CSB computer animation depicts the sequence of events over an 11-hour period leading to the explosion at the BP Texas City refinery on March 23, 2005. Several units at the Texas City refinery had been shut down for lengthy maintenance projects, which required nearly a thousand contractors to be on site along with BP employees. BP had positioned a number of portable trailers close to process units for the use of contractors and other maintenance workers. Over a period of months, BP had located 10 trailers for workers servicing the Ultra Cracker unit, including a double-wide wood frame trailer that contained 11 offices and was regularly used for meetings. Though these trailers were located near the isomerization unit, the occupants were not warned the ISOM unit was about to start up, a potentially hazardous operation. At 2.15 a.m. on March 23rd, overnight operators began introducing flammable liquid hydrocarbons, known as raffinate, into a 170-foot-tall raffinate splitter tower used to distill and separate gasoline components. Near the base of the tower, there was a single instrument that measured how much liquid was inside. It transmitted this information to a central control room located away from the ISOM unit. But this level indicator was not designed to measure liquid above the nine foot mark. During normal operation, the tower was only supposed to contain about six and a half feet of liquid. But during startups, operators routinely deviated from written procedures and filled the tower above the nine foot mark, concerned that if the liquid level fluctuated too low, it would cause costly damage to the furnace. 
At 3.09 a.m., as the liquid neared the eight-foot mark, a high-level alarm activated and sounded in the control room. But a second high-level alarm, slightly further up the tower, failed to go off. By 3.30 a.m., the level indicator showed that liquid had filled the bottom nine feet of the tower and the feed was stopped. The CSB later estimated that the liquid was in fact at a height of 13 feet, but operators could not know the actual level because the indicator only measured up to nine feet. The lead operator had been overseeing the startup from a satellite control room within the ISOM unit. At 5 a.m., he briefly updated the night board operator in the central control room about the startup activities. The lead operator then left the refinery early, an hour before the end of the shift. A new board operator arrived in the control room around 6 a.m. to start his 30th day in a row working a 12-hour shift. He spoke briefly with the departing night shift operator and then read the logbook to prepare for the startup. But the logbook did not clearly indicate how much liquid was already in the tower and equipment, and it left no instructions on routing of the liquid feed and products when the startup resumed. Instead, the control board operator only found a one-line logbook entry that said, ISOM brought in some RAF to unit to pack RAF with. At 7.15 a.m., the day shift supervisor arrived. Because he was more than an hour late, he received no formal briefing from personnel on the night shift about conditions in the ISOM unit. At 9.51 a.m., operators resumed the startup. They began recirculating the liquid feed and adding more liquid to the already overfilled tower. As new feed was added, startup procedures called for regulating the liquid level in the tower using the automatic level control valve. But the board operator and others had received conflicting instructions on routing the product. As a result, this critical valve was left closed for several hours, blocking the flow of liquid from the tower. A few minutes later, operators lit burners on the furnace to begin heating up the feed, part of the normal startup process. While the startup was underway, the day supervisor left the refinery on short notice just before 11 a.m. to attend to a family medical emergency. Contrary to BP's own procedures, no experienced supervisor was assigned to replace him. This left a single control board operator, now without a qualified supervisor, to run three refinery units, including the ISOM unit, which needed close attention. The refinery had eliminated a second board operator position following corporate budget cuts in 1999 after BP acquired Amoco. As the startup continued, the tower steadily filled with liquid, reaching a height of 98 feet shortly before noon, more than 15 times the normal level. But the improperly calibrated level indicator told operators in the control room that the liquid was at 8.4 feet and gradually falling. Furthermore, the control panel was not configured to clearly warn operators of the growing danger. It did not display flows into and out of the tower on the same screen, nor did it calculate the total liquid in the tower. Meanwhile, the maintenance contractors who were not involved in the operation of the ISOM unit left their work trailers to attend a company lunch, celebrating a month without a lost time injury. At 12.41 p.m., an alarm activated as the rising liquid compressed the gases remaining in the top of the tower. Unable to understand the source of the high pressure, operators opened a manual chain valve to vent gases to the unit's emergency relief system, a 1950s-era blowdown drum that vented vapor directly into the atmosphere. Operators also turned off two burners in the furnace to lower the temperature inside the tower, believing this would reduce the pressure. Nobody knew the tower was dangerously full. The operators did become concerned about the lack of flow out of the tower and began opening the valve to send liquid from the bottom of the tower to storage tanks. But this liquid was very hot. As it flowed through the heat exchanger, it suddenly raised the temperature of the liquid entering high up the tower by 141 degrees Fahrenheit. It was now about 1 p.m., Contract workers, unaware of the startup and the looming danger, 
returned from lunch and began a meeting in the double-wide trailer in the corner room closest to the blowdown drum. Over the next few minutes, the hot feed entering the tower caused the liquid inside to start to boil and swell. Liquid filled the tower completely and began spilling into the overhead vapor line, exerting great pressure on the emergency relief valves 150 feet below. At 1.14 p.m., the three emergency valves opened, sending nearly 52,000 gallons of flammable liquid to the blowdown drum at the other end of the ISOM unit. Liquid rose inside the blowdown drum and overflowed into a process sewer, setting off alarms in the control room. But the high-level alarm on the blowdown drum failed to go off. None of the operators knew of the catastrophe unfolding in the ISOM unit. As flammable hydrocarbons overfilled the blowdown drum, operators nearby saw a geyser of liquid and vapor erupt from the top of the stack. The equivalent of nearly a tanker truck full of hot gasoline fell to the ground and began forming a huge flammable vapor cloud. This scene, based on CSB computer modeling, shows how the vapor cloud expanded in just 90 seconds, engulfing the unit and the nearby trailers full of workers. About 25 feet from the base of the blowdown drum, two workers were parked in a pickup truck with the engine idling. As flammable vapor entered the air intake, the diesel engine began to race. The two workers fled, unable to shut off the engine. Moments later, witnesses saw the truck backfire and ignite the vapor cloud. Powerful explosions swept through the area. Computer modeling shows how the blast pressure wave accelerated through the ISOM unit, causing heavy destruction and igniting fires throughout the area. The workers inside the trailers were right in the path of the explosions. The fires continued to burn for hours. Twelve of the 20 occupants of the double-wide trailer were killed, along with three workers in a trailer nearby. Dozens of others suffered serious burns, fractures, and other traumatic injuries. The wood and metal frame trailers were blown apart by the blasts. Firefighters struggled to rescue the injured and recover the victims. Fifty large chemical storage tanks were damaged, and the ISOM unit remained shut down for more than two years. During the early stages of our investigation, our team had noted there were multiple safety system deficiencies at the Texas City plant. We also found there was a history of fatalities at the plant. Prior to the March 2005 accident, 23 people died in accidents over a 30-year period at the Texas City refinery, beginning when it was owned by Amoco and continuing after BP acquired the refinery in 1999. The CSB wanted to know what the connection was between this history of fatal incidents and uh, the organizational and cultural factors. BP Corporation's lack of focus on preventing major accidents allowed budget cuts to be made without assessing the impact on process safety. The CSB found that cost-cutting, production pressures, and failure to invest significantly impacted the process safety performance at the Texas City refinery and left the refinery vulnerable to catastrophe. After the merger with Amoco, BP ordered a 25% reduction in fixed costs at all its refineries. This impacted important process safety systems such as staffing, training, and mechanical integrity. The effects of the budget cuts became apparent in a number of internal BP documents made public following the accident. In one, the refinery manager was quoted as having observed in 2002 that the infrastructure at Texas City was in complete decline. He ordered a study of the refinery's safety and mechanical integrity, a study which was shown to BP executives in London. That study warned of serious concerns about the potential for a major site incident following more than 80 hydrocarbon releases in the previous two years. The study also concluded that its own findings were urgent and far-reaching. 
A follow-up BP study in 2002 found the refinery's integrity and reliability issues were clearly linked to the reduction in maintenance spend over the last decade. In 2003, a maintenance assessment stated that cost-cutting measures have intervened with the group's work to get things right. Usually, reliability improvements are cut. And later that year, a company audit found the current condition of the infrastructure and assets is poor at Texas City and that maintenance spending was limited by a checkbook mentality. Only the money on hand would be spent rather than increasing the budget. In March 2004, BP auditors in London concluded that 35 business units around the world, including the Texas City refinery, suffered from a host of common safety problems, including widespread tolerance of non-compliance with basic HSE or health safety and environmental rules, poor implementation of safety management systems, and lack of leadership competence and understanding. There were a number of reports that were coming up to as high as the board level that indicated serious problems throughout the BP system. During 2004, the Texas City refinery had three major accidents. In addition to this process unit fire that caused $30 million in damage, two other accidents in 2004 resulted in three fatalities. Yet this same year, the refinery had its lowest ever recordable injury rate, a statistic that does not include fatalities. The CSB found that maintenance spending increased between 2003 and 2004. But most of the increases were for responding to serious accidents and complying with environmental requirements, not for preventive maintenance. Late in 2004, the Texas City refinery manager made a presentation to supervisors titled Safety Reality, reviewing fatalities at the plant over the past 30 years. One of the slides was entitled, Texas City is not a safe place to work. BP did its own safety culture survey that was done just prior to the accident. That survey indicated there was an exceptional degree of fear among employees of a major catastrophe. Among the findings of the survey, the pressure for production, time pressure, and understaffing are the major causes of accidents at Texas City. Critical events, like failures or breakdowns, are generally not attended to. Production and budget compliance gets recognized and rewarded above anything else. Sociology professor Dr. Andrew Hopkins has written extensively on the causes of industrial disasters. My feeling is that the solution to this problem of cost-cutting by senior people is to hold them responsible for the safety implications of those cost cuts. So that when they order a cost cut, they should personally be able to certify that these things will not have adverse safety consequences. The safety culture survey also pointed to the exceptionally high executive turnover at the refinery. Six different business unit leaders or BULs in seven years prior to the accident. The authors of the survey report concluded we have never seen an organization with such a history of leadership changes over such a short period of time. Many managers are in and out within a, a space of two years, and what they are assessed on the basis of is the, the profit they make in, on an annual basis. Now, am I, as a manager, am I going to spend a large amount of money to deal with some remote risk uh, that is very unlikely to generate a major accident during my year or two uh, on, on my watch here. The survey of Texas City employees also found concern about safety and equipment checks potentially left undone. There was a check the box mentality, which indicated that personnel would go through the motions with various policies and procedures, but the work would not be conducted. For example, the tower high level alarm had been reported as not functioning several times in the two years prior to the accident. But maintenance work orders for this alarm were closed, although the repairs were never actually made. Work orders could be comp closed out as completed, even though the work hadn't been performed. This is important because we found that on the day of the incident during the ISOM startup, there were a number of instruments and equipment that were not functioning properly. 
On February 20, 2005, a company safety manager wrote, I truly believe we are on the verge of something bigger happening. Then, three weeks later, a BP business plan recognized a number of key safety risks, including that TCS, or Texas City Site, kills someone in the next 12 to 18 months. Eight days later, those fears were realized. Here were these warnings. These audits were, uh, were, were sounding very clear warnings. So why weren't they attended to? Uh, I think my feeling is that Texas City was virtually paralyzed by the cost-cutting which had occurred at that site, and they were simply unable to respond uh, to those warnings. There needs to be somebody on the board of directors who can interpret those reports and be in position to drive change effectively. The CSB's final report recommended that BP appoint an additional non-executive member of the board of directors with specific expertise in refinery operations and process safety. So the problem at Texas City was that they were essentially um, blind to this issue of process safety. They were uh, focusing on personal safety. The CSB concluded that over a period of years, BP managers focused on lowering rates for personal injuries, such as slips, trips, and falls, while often disregarding key process safety indicators. We as uh, members of the traveling public uh, intuitively understand that the numbers of baggage handling injuries really tells us nothing about the likelihood of a major accident, an aircraft crash, and no airline in its right mind is going to try and convince the travelling public of how safe it is by telling you about its workforce injury statistics. Dr. Trevor Kletz is an internationally recognised chemical process safety expert. Process safety deals with the uh, fires and explosions and toxic releases and things like that. And you can have a very good accident rate for what we call hard hat accidents, but not for uh, process ones. There are a whole series of incidents occurring at BP in the years prior to the accident, gas releases, um, other kinds of, of releases, fires, all of which were telling you that process safety was not well managed. Do you need to measure process safety performance with the appropriate indicators, both leading and lagging indicators? Lagging indicators measure events that have already occurred, such as fires, explosions, and equipment failures. Leading indicators are designed to predict the likelihood of an accident before it occurs. For example, the percentage of equipment inspections that are overdue. The opening of a safety release a pressure relief valve is itself an indicator uh, that things are not as they should be. So we should count those and try and reduce the number of occurrences of those sorts of events. But the investigation found that BP did not effectively use leading and lagging indicators to measure and drive process safety performance. For example, BP's pay plan rewarded managers primarily for controlling costs. The only safety metric used to calculate bonuses was the personal injury rate. Process safety was not considered. The CSB final report recommended that the United Steelworkers Union and the American Petroleum Institute create a new standard for process safety indicators for the petrochemical industry. The board also called on BP to use leading and lagging indicators to strengthen refinery safety performance. After an accident, managers often say, I didn't know this was happening, or not happening, as the case may be. If I'd known, I'd have stopped it. Now, this is bad management. It's the manager's job to know what is going on. And he can do that by going round and by um, keeping his eyes open and and reading the accident reports in detail. The CSB investigation noted that BP ignored numerous warnings of the potential for a catastrophic accident, a result of not having an effective reporting and learning culture. Glenn Irwin is a safety official with the United Steelworkers and was a member of the independent panel that examined BP's safety culture. I believe it's very important that we do have an open and a trusting environment to where people can raise concerns and they can tell management if they see a condition or, they, or something that is out of the ordinary. BP's own internal audits, however, indicated a trusting environment was lacking. 
In 2005, the Texas City maintenance manager said in an email that the refinery has a ways to go to becoming a learning culture and away from a punitive culture. It was a long-standing problem. In 2000, the BP refinery in Grangemouth, Scotland, had three serious incidents, including a large process unit fire. An investigation by the British Health and Safety Executive highlighted problems at the Grangemouth refinery that would show up again five years later in Texas City. There was need for corporate and board oversight over process safety management. There was a need to develop leading and lagging indicators for process safety, and there needed to be an emphasis on process safety in order to prevent major accidents. But the CSB found little awareness in Texas City of the lessons BP executives promised would be learned worldwide after Grangemouth. As British regulators concluded, BP's decentralized management structure impaired learning from previous incidents. And the reason why BP failed to learn these lessons from other events, the reason why they uh, seem to have this, what I would call, learning disability, lies in the, um, the way in which the organisation was designed. It lies in the bonus systems of payment. It lies in the decentralised uh, structure of the organisation. It lies in the, the organisational location of process safety experts. The CSB found that following the 1999 merger with Amoco, BP dismantled Amoco's existing centralised safety structure. The reorganization left a diminished process safety function that no longer reported to senior refinery leadership. So I think the lesson, one of the lessons coming out of that is that if an organization judges something important, it will um, locate people at, towards the top of the apex in that organization, people with responsibility for that. And the fact that the process safety manager was further down the line is yet another indication of the lack of focus on process safety. A positive safety culture would ensure that incidents are being reported, that they're being followed up on, that there's enough resources to ensure adequate safety. Over the years at Texas City, many critical incidents were not reported, nor were the lessons acted upon to prevent future catastrophic events. And it's also in human nature, there's a tendency to say, oh gosh, that was a near one, I'm glad that lead didn't catch fire. Let's forget about it and get on with the job. For example, BP wasn't investigating abnormal conditions that were occurring repeatedly during startups of the ISOM unit. The CSB examined 19 previous startups in the five years prior to the ISOM incident and found in the vast majority of these startups, the operators ran a high level above the range of the level transmitter. The problem with running the level above the reading is that you don't know how high the level really is. This can lead to grossly overfilling the tower. But even though high levels and pressures could have led to a catastrophic accident, the previous startups were never investigated as near misses, and procedural deviations became accepted as normal. The CSB investigation also found eight serious releases of flammable vapor from the ISOM blowdown drum, two of which caught fire between 1994 and 2004. Only three of the incidents were ever investigated. Well, it's widely recognised now that you should that you should investigate near misses, or really near accidents, what they call near misses, as thoroughly as you investigate um, accidents. After all, it's only a matter of luck whether a, le a leak of flammable liquid or gas catches fire or not. In our final report, the CSB recommended that BP's Board of Directors establish a system to encourage reporting of incidents without fear of retaliation, to investigate and implement prompt corrective actions, and to communicate lessons throughout the company. The first choice after an accident is to say, how can we improve the design so this can't happen? How can we remove the opportunity for errors? Even as releases occurred over many years in the ISOM unit, BP continued using equipment based on outdated designs. The Raffinate Splitter Tower lacked modern design safeguards, such as redundant level indicators and alarms, a differential pressure indicator, and automatic interlocks to prevent overfilling. In a well-designed plant, a simple error like closing the own valve shouldn't result in an accident. The design of the emergency pressure relief system was also outdated. 
relief valves vented hydrocarbons directly to the atmosphere through an antiquated blowdown drum, which was first installed in the 1950s. The CSB report said the hydrocarbon should have been routed to an inherently safer disposal system, such as a flare, to contain the hydrocarbon liquid and burn off flammable vapor. In fact, the investigation found that Amoco's own safety standards, later adopted by BP, stated that new blowdown stacks which discharge directly to the atmosphere are not permitted. As facilities were upgraded, existing blowdown systems which are still necessary should be replaced. Several occasions prior to the incident, BP had seriously considered connecting a flare to the ISOM unit. In the early 1990s, when Amoco owned the refinery, three proposals were made to replace blowdown stacks at Texas City. Two more proposals were made in 2002, after the merger with BP. However, these decisions were impacted by production pressures and budget cuts, and the flare was never constructed. In 1992, OSHA conducted an inspection at the Texas City Refinery because they had been released from a very similar blowdown drum in a different process unit. OSHA cited the then Amoco refinery for the unsafe blowdown system. OSHA determined that the design of the blowdown drum was unsafe because it did relieve to atmosphere. It didn't relieve to a safe place. But OSHA later withdrew the citation after Amoco asserted the equipment conformed to American Petroleum Institute standards. In October 2006, the board issued a recommendation to the American Petroleum Institute calling for new guidelines that warn against the use of blowdown drums similar to those found in Texas City. We also recommended that OSHA implement a national emphasis program for all oil refineries focused on the hazards of blowdown drums that release to the atmosphere. Whenever possible, companies should use inherently safer systems, such as flares, instead of blowdown drums. The presence of occupied trailers near the blowdown stack added to the hazards of venting flammable material to the atmosphere. Prior to the incident and prior to the startup of the ISOM unit, a number of trailers, occupied trailers, had been placed close to the ISOM unit. These, these trailers were occupied by workers who were not involved in the turnaround activities in the ISOM unit. The investigation found this was a key factor leading to the deaths of the workers. They were right on top of the process uh, in trailers close to, as close as 120 feet from the blowdown, blowdown drum, which is right at the edge of the isomerization process. CSB investigator Mark Kasniak. Well, it is not safe to have trailers that, that close to a blowdown drum or at the edge of a, an active process in a, in a petroleum refinery. During an explosion in a refinery, you're actually safer in the open atmosphere than if you were working inside of a trailer. This is because the explosion overpressure uh, will destroy the weak trailer construction, resulting in the formation of missiles and walls collapsing, which, which is potentially fatal to the occupants. The CSB determined that industry siting guidelines did not adequately protect trailer occupants from the fire and blast damage that can occur hundreds of feet from an explosion like the one at BP. We found that these guidelines were not safe enough prior to this accident and resulted in placing people uh, in harm's way. In addition, BP did not follow its own management of change procedures before placing most of the trailers in a dangerous location. They did not assess the blast hazards posed to the trailer and uh, action items that were created during the review were never followed up and corrected. Ultimately, the decision on where to place the trailers was largely based on convenience not safety. And contrary to BP startup procedures, on the morning of March 23rd, managers did not remove personnel from the nearby trailers or even alert them that the potentially hazardous startup was taking place. The explosion totally destroyed 13 trailers and damaged 27 others, some as far away as 1,000 feet. People inside trailers as far away as 479 feet were injured. In October 2005, the CSB issued an urgent recommendation to the American Petroleum Institute to revise industry standards and establish minimum safe distances for occupied trailers away from hazardous process areas. On June 21, 2007, the American Petroleum Institute issued new industry guidelines to minimize the presence of people and occupied trailers 
in hazardous process areas. For a long time, people were saying that most accidents were due to human error. And this is true in a sense, but um, it's not very helpful. It's a bit like saying that falls are due to gravity. There were a number of human errors that contributed to the overfilling of the tower and the disaster that followed at Texas City. No one shows up to work planning to make mistakes. So we looked at the conditions in the workplace that would make error more likely. You really need to look at why the operators did what they did. CSB Human Factors Specialist Cheryl McKenzie. There were a number of human factors issues involved um, with this incident, including uh, fatigue of the uh, workers, training uh, that was insufficient, and uh, procedural deviations that occurred during the startup. The CSB investigation found that underlying conditions in the ISOM unit encouraged operators to consciously deviate from written operating procedures. Why did they make that judgment? I think they did because these procedures were, uh, some of them were out of date, some of them were inapplicable, they were routinely not following these procedures and nobody had said otherwise, nobody had said, hang on, you must be following these procedures. The investigation found that operators were concerned that if they let the liquid level in the tower get too low during startups, it would damage the furnace. So they had adopted an informal procedure of adding extra liquid to the tower during startup. To do this, they placed the level control valve in manual, not the automatic mode required by procedures, and left the valve closed to raise the liquid above the recommended six and a half foot level. So routine had this practice become, the CSB found that the tower's high level alarm had activated 65 times during the previous 19 startups. The outdated operating procedures for the unit did not establish any safe upper limit for the liquid level in the tower. Unknown to operators, regularly overfilling the tower had serious risks. The tower's liquid level transmitter had a limited range, and should the liquid rise above the maximum reading of 9 feet, operators could not know if the tower was dangerously overfilling. This informal practice of running the level in the raffinate splitter tower above the range of the transmitter led to running blind. They weren't aware of the dangers of overfilling the column, and so they tended to um, err on the side of what they saw as caution by overfilling the column. So their, their systematic deviation from what they should have been doing was actually well-intentioned. It was with the interests of the company at heart that they were, uh, they were violating the uh, startup procedures. But on the day of the accident, the routine deviation, overfilling the tower above the range of the indicator, coincided with a number of instrument failures, which impaired the board operator's decision-making. This had tragic results as the board operator lost awareness of just how high the level was. The tower level indicator had been calibrated for years based on 1975 data for a different liquid used in a different process. As a result of the miscalibration, the indicator showed the level in the tower was declining just prior to the explosion, when it was actually increasing. And a backup high-level alarm on the tower failed to activate seeming to confirm that the liquid level was dropping. A sight glass on the tower was dirty and unreadable and could not be used to visually check the liquid level. The investigation concluded that the board operator truly had no functional and accurate measure of the tower level on March 23, 2005. And when the liquid finally did spill over into the blowdown drum, the high-level alarm there failed to go off. BP procedures required that alarms and instruments and other equipment be checked for their functionality prior to startup. The CSB determined that these checks were largely not performed. A poorly designed computer display in the control room added to the difficulty of determining if the splitter tower was overfilling. Liquid flows into and out of the tower were not shown on the same screen, even though the computer could have been configured to do so. The investigation also found that communication problems among BP personnel during the morning of the startup increased the likelihood of errors. Operators received contradictory instructions on where to send the products from the tower, and the day shift operators never got clear information from the night shift 
about how much liquid the tower already contained. Well, then the board operator and the other operators that came in uh, during the day shift really didn't understand what had occurred the night before, so they're starting up this unit without full knowledge of the state of the unit, and uh, um, they're making judgments and decisions uh, based on incomplete information. The investigation found that BP lacked adequate policies and a management emphasis on effective communications. Key instructions on sending the feed into the tower were given over the phone and radio instead of in writing. Operators later told investigators these verbal communications were rushed and vague. Written communications in the logbook were brief and unclear. Night shift operators did not conduct a crucial face-to-face -face meeting to brief day shift operators on the conditions in the unit. Therefore, uh, they didn't realize uh, how much liquid was in the, the tower and the equipment, so they added more, which led to the subsequent overfilling of the tower, which later led to the release. The opportunities for human error were multiplied by the lack of adequate supervision, staffing, and training at the refinery. Training had been downsized, and that uh, training was largely delivered through computerized means rather than face-to-face -face training. BP did not train operators on the hazards of overfilling towers, and training for abnormal situations was insufficient. Despite recommendations dating back five years, simulators were not used to train board operators on making critical decisions. As noted in an internal BP email about simulators three weeks after the accident, big pushback has always been initial cost. Budget pressures also impacted control room staffing. BP implemented a 25% cost reduction in 99. During the same time period, BP downsized the board operators in the ISOM unit from two to one. Later, BP added an additional process unit to the responsibilities of the board operator in the ISOM unit. The result was that you had three complex refinery units under the supervision of one board operator. According to BP's own assessment, even under normal conditions, Monitoring and controlling these three units would require 10 and a half hours of the board operator's 12-hour shift. But the startup of the ISOM unit would demand significantly more time and attention from the operator, whose workload was already nearly full. And when the startup began to encounter problems late that morning, supervisory oversight of the board operator was absent. BP's own policies required that a supervisor or technically trained person be present during startup because it's an especially hazardous period. The supervisor who showed up on March 23rd left due to a family emergency and there was no replacement. Finally, investigators looked at the role operator fatigue played as a human factor contributing to the accident. Fatigue can affect performance in many ways. It can cloud decision making, it can delay responses uh, to actions on a control board, and uh, it can lead uh, an operator to uh, miss out on what's going on overall in a unit. Fatigue can impair judgment. It can lead an operator to fixate on one operational parameter, such as the declining level, and lose track of other factors, such as liquid being added to the tower, for three hours and no liquid being removed. ISOM unit operators had been working 12-hour shifts for at least 29 days prior to the accident. In particular, the board operator was likely suffering from fatigue, including acute sleep loss and accumulative sleep debt of more than 43 hours. We determined that BP had no fatigue prevention policy, and in fact, there was no fatigue pre prevention policy in the industry as a whole. Companies and employees may believe they benefit from overtime schedules, particularly during maintenance turnarounds, but operator fatigue can have deadly consequences. Our final report recommended that the United Steelworkers and the American Petroleum Institute develop new guidance on preventing fatigue in the petrochemical industry, including limits on hours and days at work. OSHA's 1992 Standard on Process Safety Management, or PSM, requires thousands of oil and chemical facilities to implement 14 management elements to prevent catastrophic releases. 
The Environmental Protection Agency has similar requirements under its risk management program. The CSB investigation revealed many long-standing deficiencies in the BP refinery's compliance with federal process safety regulations. Preventive maintenance and testing procedures were inadequate for key alarms, instruments, and equipment. Required safety studies of pressure relief systems were years overdue. Operating procedures were out of date. And there were other flaws. Management of change reviews were not conducted for critical design, equipment, and procedural changes. Hazard analyses were poor, overlooking serious fire and explosion risks. Audits revealed many process safety problems, but they were never resolved. OSHA's enforcement program for the PSM regulations requires planned, comprehensive inspections of facilities with accident histories or other indications of catastrophic risks. A 1992 OSHA directive stated the primary enforcement tool would be the Program Quality Verification Inspection, or PQV, a large, complex audit involving highly trained OSHA inspectors and taking weeks or months to complete. Despite the fact that the BP Texas City Refinery had a long history of fatality incidents, there was no program quality verification or intensive PSM inspection conducted at that refinery. OSHA did conduct smaller unplanned inspections of the Texas City Refinery in response to accidents and complaints, but these inspections did not uncover major flaws in process safety management compliance. In fact, the CSB found that OSHA conducted only a handful of program quality verification, PQV, inspections at the thousands of regulated facilities across the country. There's no set interval when OSHA comes in and inspects a plant in the United States. We found that inspections in the U.S. are largely driven by personal injury statistics. The CSB also found that prior to March 2005, the EPA never audited the Texas City Refinery for compliance with risk management requirements. Other jurisdictions inspect process plants more frequently. In California's Contra Costa County, a local process safety ordinance requires thorough inspections of 48 major oil and chemical plants every three years by a team of specialized engineers. In the United Kingdom, 105 specialists from the Health and Safety Executive inspect high-hazard facilities every five years. In addition, all nine refineries in the UK are inspected annually. If accepted process safety principles had been thoroughly implemented at the refinery, this accident likely would not have occurred. The CSB recommended that OSHA take steps to conduct more process safety inspections and strengthen enforcement of the PSM standard. OSHA should identify those facilities at greatest risk, see that comprehensive inspections are conducted at such facilities, and to establish the capacity to conduct those inspections, OSHA should create a group of highly trained PSM inspectors. On June 12, 2007, OSHA announced a new national emphasis program to inspect most U.S. oil refineries for process safety compliance. I participated in the panel because I lost a near and dear friend in this incident. A personal friend of mine was killed in this incident. And I thought it was very important that, that the management systems be looked at with a fresh set of eyes. Early in the investigation of the Texas City accident, the CSB observed what appeared to be a pattern of safety deficiencies. We therefore issued an urgent recommendation, the first ever by this agency, that BP convene an independent panel of experts to study the safety culture of its five North American refineries. In October 2005, BP established an 11-member panel that included leading industry, labor, and academic safety experts. It was headed by former Secretary of State James A. Baker III. The panel found that BP did not ensure, as a matter of best practices, that its management implemented a comprehensive and effective process safety management system. The report, issued in 2007, concluded there were instances of a lack of operating discipline, toleration of serious deviations from safe operating practices, and apparent complacency toward serious process safety risks at each of BP's North American refineries. 
The Baker panel also voiced concern that other companies share similar problems. Ladies and gentlemen, we are under no illusion that such deficiencies are in fact limited to BP. One of the things that I'd like to see personally, after having served on the Baker panel, is that we will never have another incident of this magnitude, the number of people that were killed, the number of lives that were changed. So many good, hardworking people go to work every day, and too often, some never return. I think the work that we did in the Baker panel, I believe that if, this, if our work is applied within our industry, we will not see another BP explosion. The Baker panel report concluded that the restructuring following BP's merger with Amoco had resulted in a significant loss of people, expertise, and experience in the refining sector. Only much later did BP recognize the negative impact of these changes. The CSB's final report said all hazardous chemical operations should be required to review the safety impact of major organizational changes. The board recommended that OSHA amend its process safety management standard to require management of change reviews for mergers, acquisitions, personnel reductions, budget cuts, or other organizational changes that can impact process safety. We also recommended that the Center for Chemical Process Safety develop guidelines on how to perform organizational management of change reviews. The major problem with the chemical industry and indeed with other industries is the way accidents are investigated, reports are written, circulated, read, filed away and then forgotten. And then five, ten years later, even in the same company, the accident happens again. There is a saying that organisations have no memory. Only people have memory. Once they leave the plant, the accident, the code there is forgotten about. And what uh, companies must do in the petrochemical industry is realise that the fact that you've had 20 years without a catastrophic, a catastrophic event is no guarantee that there won't be one tomorrow. You have to keep your eye on the ball constantly. All oil and chemical businesses should seek to learn from the tragedy at BP. The CSB believes there are key lessons to be drawn from our investigation. The CSB said, managers, executives and boards of directors should do the following. Monitor process safety performance using appropriate indicators. Invest sufficient resources to correct problems. Maintain an open and trusting safety culture where near misses are reported and investigated. Ensure that non-essential personnel and work trailers are located a safe distance from hazardous process areas. Ensure equipment and procedures are maintained and up to date. Carefully manage organizational changes and budget decisions to ensure safety is not compromised. Analyze and correct the underlying causes of human errors, including fatigue and miscommunication. Finally, boards of directors must exercise their duty to ensure that the highest standards of safety are met. The BP tragedy was years in the making, but it was by no means inevitable. We hope our investigation will provide all of industry with valuable lessons to assure such a tragedy will not be repeated. For the CSB's final report, key investigation documents, the Baker Panel Report, and other information, please visit the Chemical Safety Board website at csb.gov. BP cooperated with the CSB investigation and provided documents and witnesses voluntarily. After the Texas City accident, BP acted to relocate trailers, eliminate blowdown drums, and invest billions of dollars to upgrade the condition of its U.S. refineries. In 2007, BP accepted the recommendations of the Baker panel, including a call to become a recognized industry leader in process safety management. <laughs>